So, Dave, you're you're American. I am. You know, I am. Land of the BattleBots. <laughs> what are you going to do about this? Are you just going to sit on your ass and just whinge about it on our podcast? Smashing Security, Episode 326, Ride Royal Security Threats and Move It Mayhem, with Carol Terrio and Graham Cluley. Hello, hello, and welcome to Smashing Security, Episode 326. My name's Graham Cluley. And I'm Carol Terrio. And this week, Carol, we are joined by podcast royalty, aren't we? Always. Cyberwire's Dave Bittner. Hello. Hi, Dave. Hi. <laughs> nice to be here. Yes, you're a very busy guy. You do a lot of shows. It's so I do. Cool. We're very. He doesn't lucky. do that many. He doesn't do that many. <laughs> he does do a lot of shows. I think he could crank out a few more each day if he really tried harder. <laughs> sure, why not? He's not really tried hard enough. I'm sure his blood pressure could deal with it. Yeah, my family doesn't need to see me. It's fine. Sure. <laughs> But before we kick off, let's thank this week's wonderful sponsors, Bitwarden, Collide, and Hunters. It's their support that help us give you this show for free. Now, coming up on today's show, Graham, what do you got? I'm going to be talking about some right royal security breaches. (laughs) And what about you, Dave? I have a revelation from the U.S. government about how much data they're vacuuming up about their citizens. (laughs) And I like to move it, move it. All this and much more coming up on this episode of Smashing Security. Now, I realize after some... Hang on a minute. I forgot something, didn't I? Chums, chums. I realize, that's better, after some 325-odd episodes of Smashing Security, there are some areas of security that we haven't really touched upon enough. Things, you know, there's some things where we've perhaps done a little bit too much. I'm thinking Telly Dildonics. Twitter. Uh, that, yes, Elon Musk, anything related to him. Um, Chat GPT. Uh, but, but there's some things, some things that maybe we haven't looked at enough. And that is one of the things which I'd like to look at today is physical security. Hmm. Okay, you can secure your networks, you can secure your gateways, your laptops. How well are we doing at securing our company's buildings from attack, from preventing people from actually coming through the front door before stealing something from our corporation? So I thought that'd be interesting to talk about. Now, regular listeners will be aware that I'm a big fan of British institutions, the things which made Great Britain great, Doctor Who, the hovercraft. The World Wide Web. Invading loads of countries around the world for centuries. Yes, yeah. hush, hush, hush. I mean, surely all of those... <laughs> Colonialism. <laughs> surely, surely... Now, now, now. Surely. Let's, let's, not, let's not dwell on those. Um, but yes, there's been a bit of that as well. Uh, there's been other good things. Gravity didn't exist before Isaac Newton invented it when the apple fell on his head. Didn't have that. Sure. We came along. We invented it. Thank goodness for that. You know, there's that old joke about um, why do the British drink warm beer? Mm. Because Lucas Electronics makes their refrigerators. <laughs> <laughs> oh, charming. It's like complaining about our teeth. Well, <laughs> yes, or the reliability of a Jaguar car, right? Ooh, fighting talk. Now, <laughs> there are lots of wonderful institutions over here. Um, one of them is, of course, the honors system, uh, which has been in the news lately. Alexander Boris de Peffel Johnson, if you remember him, the former prime minister. Uh, Dave, if you don't remember, he's the one who looks like a mayonnaise-covered potato dipped in a bucket of straw. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been <laughs> handing out gongs recently to a bunch of his closest disciples. Handing out what? Co- gongs, uh, sort of awards, titles, oh. damehoods. Gongs. I've never heard that expression. Have you not? No. no. No, me neither. Okay. Oh, I hope I haven't said the wrong thing. It's definitely not dongs. I'm pretty no. sure it's gongs. Yeah. I was just thinking of a like a Chinese gong, and over here we had the Gong Show, but I did, I've gong never show, heard. Yeah, I never yeah. heard of gongs being uh, used as a uh, some sort of honorific. Interesting. Listeners, don't at me if I've got that wrong. All right, just don't. <laughs> don't. I probably have. Um, but anyway, the current prime minister, he wasn't very happy about it. And it's been all a bit, a bit of a t- bit of a to do about it all. But but if you do become a knight like the uh, recently anointed. Sir Michael Fabricant, MP. Shut up. Or, has he? He really he has. He got a knighthood? <laughs> yes, from from Boris Johnson. Or Dame Pretty Patel, who will be... Anyway, they basically have been awarded 
these great honours, which means that they'll be able to get tables in restaurants for the rest of their life because they, of course, have provided services to, well, what you'd get if you threw Donald Trump a hay bale and a thesaurus into a washing machine, what we call Boris Johnson. And (coughs) if you get one of those awards, you will get an invitation to go and receive the award at Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle and King Charles will pin on the medal or clonk you on the shoulder with his or sword gong, and tell you right? to arise. The gong. Yes, yes, he'll put yeah. the gong he'll put the gong on you. Okay. He'll put the gong on okay. you. And um I'm talking about Windsor Castle specifically because they have just been declassified by the National Archive a number of papers about a number of things to do with Windsor Castle, including a document which looks at security scares which have happened there over the years. And I thought, well, that would be quite interesting for us to look at because I believe there's a lot we can learn by looking at things from the past, things which have happened in the past. You know, history repeats itself, lessons which we can learn from this. Mm. Yeah, a postmortem, if you will. So this has been covered in the Metro newspaper. They got their hands on this dossier let out by the National Archive. And it contains details of security incidents dating back to the late 1960s, which have until now been a closely guarded secret. So more than five decades, these things have been kept hush-hush. So what they found was that in the three years running up to February 1970, there had been 27 crimes committed on the grounds of Windsor Castle. Security incidents, if you like. Most of these were... Petty thefts. So it might be, for instance, I don't know. I took two croissants at breakfast instead of one. <laughs> a souvenir, like you steal a spoon or something. Well, don't you think everyone probably tries that? Yeah. Don't you think no. if you get an invitation to Buckingham Palace? Well, come on. What about the royal toilet paper? Wouldn't you want to pinch what, some take of that? Take a roll. Crawl? What? Take a few sheets in my bag? No. Take an extra few sheets, right? So when you're <laughs> using a couple of sheets, I don't know how many you use. You could tear off another couple. <laughs> And put them in my pocket. Put them in your pocket or your purse and then ask frame the queen, them. Ask the, ask the king to sign them. Well, mm-hmm. well, well, that may be a bit of a giveaway. I don't know. But you could. <laughs> it's probably going to be quite high quality. I remember flying on an airline once and I was sort of bumped up into premium economy. And they gave me these sort of metal salt and pepper shakers. And on the bottom of them, it said, stolen from Virgin Airlines. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> right. obviously they were anticipating that everyone would say, maybe the same thing happens At the palaces as well. I don't know. So there's lots of petty theft going on. But in January 1967, there was a small Chinese vase on public display in the Garter throne room, which suddenly, poof, went missing. Oh, a caper. And no one knew what happened. Was it stolen? Was it somebody who had got in and maybe hadn't set off the the pressure triggers under the carpet? Maybe they'd bounded from side to side rather than touching the ground? Mm -hmm. Or was it a clumsy maid who had sort of broken it with her feather duster and just thought, oh, crumbs, I'm going to lose my job. I'll just have to wipe them up into my pinny and get rid of the remains elsewhere. No one knows to this day. It's a mystery. Diving through a a web of lasers? Yes. Tom Cruise. I blame him too. (laughs) it, It could be. It could be. I mean, it is one of the central mysteries of British history. America has its Dealey Plaza, it has its Texas bookstore depository and the grassy knoll. We have the Chinese vase, which just disappeared from the Garter throne room. And Mm. then in March 1967, someone, which according to the declassified report, they call it a mental patient, that was the terminology at the time, was found wandering around in the courtyard, having followed an employee through what's called the advance gate. So they tailgated. And so, you know, we talk about that now, people coming into your building. Well, it was happening back in the 60s as well. People were doing that in order to get somewhere where they shouldn't be and potentially being a security threat. And this problem of unauthorised people in the grounds of Windsor Castle, that actually continues to this day, not just in this declassified report, because in April last year, there was a Spanish woman who managed to get into the grounds of Windsor Castle's Royal Lodge, where one of our favourite members of the royal family, Prince Andrew, lives. Very popular, um, Prince Andrew. Like, managed to get into the grounds. Like She got into the grounds. 
Like she we don't got know how. Past security. Oh yeah, we do know how. Oh, you're going to tell us. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So what she did was this woman. She was in her forties. Um, the way in that's which that's relevant. She, well, it, well, it, it, well, it is actually because oh. of who she claimed to be. Okay. Okay. okay? Sorry. Yeah. So well, <laughs> that's right. Because what she did was she walked up to the security gate, and there's obviously security teams there. You know, they obviously take. The security of the royal family very carefully. <laughs> Hiya, and I'm here to see Prince Andrew. <laughs> that is uncanny. Is that what happened? <laughs> I know. I'm picturing the guys in the red jackets and with the big, the big bear the fur hats. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> because they 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 protect all the royals, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh absolutely. Yeah. They went. She went up to the security gate and she said, "Hi, I'm here to have dinner with Prince Andrew." Oh my gosh. And she was allowed in without showing any ID, no questions asked, no checks made. They did say, what's your name? And she said, Irene Windsor. I mean, it could have been worse. It could have been Irene yeah. Sachs coburg Otter, or whatever. It Is that why been... he dated her? Because the Windsor, it's like, oh, well, she's obviously classy. Ah, <laughs> oh, well. The security guards even paid her cab fare. So she'd got there by taxi. And she said, oh, could you pay my taxi for me? And obviously, that sort of behaviour, they thought, well, only someone who's dating a member of the royal family or someone somehow associated with the royal family would have the cheek to ask the security guards to pay for her taxi. And so mm. they believed... Yeah, and I don't want to piss off the Prince Andrew, so I may as well pay it out of my meagre salary. Yeah. <laughs> and so they, so they paid for the taxi and said, go ahead, go up the drive, and you'll get to the lodge to have your dinner. And she walked around for about 40 minutes before anyone became suspicious. And uh, called the real police. Um, now, it was claimed that she was allowed in so easily. There was a, a guy who runs a security. He was at a cyber security uh, event. And he actually runs a company which provides protection for celebrities and VIPs. And he said the reason why this happened is that Prince Andrew is such a pain in the ass. Of course. If you've ever, <laughs> if you've ever worked for him. He's a totally unpleasant character. And security would have been terrified of asking mm -hmm. him. Is anyone turning up? Because he would have mm. spit in the head off. So, again, here's something you can learn at your own company about how to better protect yourself. If someone just wanders in with all the bravado, whether they're a Spanish woman in their 40s claiming to date the CEO or not, that they have to have their proper ID and authenticate themselves before they gain access. And finally, from this dossier, another story from the late 1960s, 24 members of the RAF in Windsor Mm -hmm. and a woman who they were presumably trying to impress as well, they decided it would be a real jape to break into Windsor Castle and steal one of the cannons. That's, that's practical. I have been to Windsor Castle before. Yes. Yeah. Those cannons aren't small. These are 24 presumably very inebriated members of the RAF, Carl. <laughs> I would I, I still, even, Their with judgment. Tw even with 25 of them, including the woman, I imagine <laughs> they won't be able to lift that. Right. Maybe they had access to a, one of Britain's great hovercrafts or some other device to <laughs> yeah. assist them. I don't I know. I say drone. I was going, mm. So my <laughs> question to you, I'm going to give you a quick question, right? This is, I'm just, got, just want you, you to put your minds together here. 24 people, how did they gain access? Did they dig a tunnel, create a human pyramid, or build a giant horse made out of wood and leave it outside the front gate? What was their way of breaking into Windsor Castle? Is one of them the right answer? Question one. It is. It is. Oh, well, obviously creating a human pyramid because when you're drunk and you don't, that's the quick... <laughs> That's the quickest yep. of them. The the others would, would require planning and tools. Yes, tools, any, any, sweat. <laughs> yeah. Any group of drunk people can create a human pyramid. You don't even need to plan it. Just walk out, waltz up to the fence, and o over you go. Yeah. Says the voice of experience, and mm -hmm. you're absolutely right, Dave. They created a human pyramid, and they managed to get into Windsor Castle. So even if you've got enormous walls outside of your building or barriers protecting your network, Human ingenuity sometimes might be able to get past. You them. know, it would have been funnier if you had said a giant badger. Just saying. Did they get the cannon? <laughs> no, they. They <laughs> turned out. Turns out they couldn't get it over the wall. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Although they've got a cannon, they could have put a hole in the wall. <laughs> That's probably the plan. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Thank you.
Dave, <laughs> what have you got for us this week? So uh, I have a story. Uh, this is widely reported. I'm, I'm using the coverage from Wired. Uh, mm. This is article written by Del Cameron. Uh, and this is about a report that uh, recently came out from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the ODNI, which reveals that the federal government is buying all kinds of data about our citizens. So no. I know, right? So this is a report that was generated back in January of 2022. Uh, it was classified. And Senator Ron Wyden, who's uh, here in the U.S., is is one of the folks He's who... He's a bet noir of anyone trying to keep something secret, isn't he? Or, or, <laughs> or, Correct. or tech companies who are scooping up your data. He's always the one. He's, He's the on one who understands things. this stuff. And, <laughs> you know, if we are ever going to get any sort of federal privacy legislation, it will probably come from yeah. him. Okay. Yeah. So what this report revealed is that there are many, many agencies within the federal government who are buying what they're describing as open source intelligence, uh, which is information that they can buy from third party providers uh about people's location about all sorts of personal information about ordinary citizens and the problem here is that uh in order for these agencies to get this information by traditional legal means they would have had to have gotten a warrant oh, what a pain but <laughs> if they buy it from a third party no warrant required what they do need Just is a, a bit of wonga well, and a purchase order, presumably, which can can be more difficult to get out <laughs> That's of true. your company sometimes than an actual federal warrant. That's true. That's true. Um, so obviously, this has a lot of folks who are concerned about privacy uh, upset. Um, and it, the calls into question, should they be allowed to do this? Mm -hmm. um, I think... It, it also calls into question, do we need some sort of federal privacy legislation here in the U.S.? Um, oh, come, come. Yes. Come, come. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what outrageous talk is this? But where I wanted to go with this was I wanted to ask the two of you, because you all live under the the cozy blanket of GDPR. and. <laughs> But do we, though? Do we still? Well, that's where I'm going with this. Ah. I really want to know, do you feel as though that makes a difference? Is your Do you feel as though your privacy is indeed protected in a way that, say, us Americans is not because you have GDPR? Do you feel as though you're still being tracked by advertisers? Do you feel as though... If people wanted to, they could buy this sort of location information about you. Where do you stand on that? But my question is, so I'll answer that in a second, but my question is actually, I'm not sure where the UK stands since it's departed from the EU. Mm. Good, good point. Well, I think for a lot of companies at the moment, because they're having to support EU customers right. who are under the umbrella of GDPR, it's a lot simpler for them to provide that same kind of layer of protection and the way in which they behave with your data as they would do with any other part of the world, including the sunny uplands of Britain. Now it mm -hmm. is outside of Europe. But there have been some tech companies who've actually deliberately decided, oh my God, it's real pain having to deal with GDPR and it gives us these disadvantages. Now Britain has come out of the European Union we can siphon off that data and process it in a different way from the rest of Europe. And that does worry me that some may well be doing that in order to take greater advantage of us. Mm. So do I feel, I, I don't know. I, th I think, I mean, in some ways this story, who's binging? <laughs> no, Who is that? Not me. Okay. I literally just put my phone on do not disturb to make sure oh. I didn't get any messages while we were calling. I thought I forgot to do it. And as soon okay. as I turned it on, four messages from you just came in. Oh. <laughs> so, which I have not read. Right, so right. <laughs> that's probably me messaging you saying, remember to turn your phone off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. Nice. Anywho, as you were saying. Anyway, anyway, anyway. So um the the interesting thing for me about this story about the US, you know, authorities buying up all this data is does this rather suggest that all those things Snowden complained about about <laughs> 
the US agencies being in bed with these big tech companies and siphoning off this data. Maybe we don't have to worry about that anymore because it sounds like maybe the tech companies aren't providing it any longer and find it more difficult. And so it's now come down to commerce. Maybe the tech companies realize, oh, we've got a value on this. We can actually sell this to the US authorities instead of them uh, actually being plugged into our servers. Hmm. What do you Mm. think, Carol? I am a huge fan of GDPR. I don't think it's implemented beautifully at the moment. Like it is super annoying to have the websites come up. I don't know. You may not have this, Dave, but for us, every time you go to any website, you are presented with a form saying, do you consent to all our cookies (laughs) or do you want to go and review? (laughs) And they're all implemented differently, which drives me nuts. Like why wouldn't there be a standardized way of saying this is what you need to show people? Yes, no, decline, you know? Uh, so I find that very frustrating. And I'm one of those idiots that go through every single time I go to a website. I oh. go and reject what I can. <laughs> Carol, do you know that there are now browser add-ons which will automatically answer those forms for you? Oh my God. So just spring up for a, a split second and then just dis- how, how well they behave on it. I, I would don't... love that. Can you send me a link? I'll, I'll, I'll send a link. <laughs> that could have been your pick of the week. I would have said that was the best pick of the week in the planet. Okay, I want one of those, definitely, for someone like me. I'm not saying they're great. Uh, they may have problems. And who knows what they're collecting, but yeah. Right. <laughs> but I'll put a link in the show notes. You can give away your rights in an automated way now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, but I, I do think that someone has to hold the uh, the giants to account. And it takes something as big as GDPR to do it. Now, is it perfect? Fuck no. But it's better than what we had, which was nada. Yeah, I mean, we've got the Fourth Amendment, which protects us from unreasonable searches and seizures. Mm-hmm. And it's something we take very seriously. And this is a this is an end around around that. And to me, it reflects that the pace at which government functions is much slower than tech. That's not news to anybody. But should government organizations be allowed to do this end around to gather this information? Now, on the other hand, in a way, we've all opted into this through EULAs, but, and, and I'll put that in air quotes because we haven't really, and that's, and I suppose that's where the regulatory regime can come in and sort of save us from ourselves. If, if it were, if it were to say, you can't gather this information, then the information wouldn't be there for the government to collect. To me, that's the solution here. So, so Dave, you're, you're American. I am. I am. Land of the battle bots. <laughs> what are you going to do about this? Are you just going to sit on your ass and just whinge about it on our podcast? Or are you going to, uh, you know, you're going to go up on the streets? Are you going to get a placard written? Are you going to store many buildings? What are you going to do about this? Because, you know, we, we're always moaning about things, but are we going to change anything? Are we going to hmm. write to our congressman or something or whatever it is you do over there? Yeah, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got a lot of podcasts to record, Graham. I'm busy. I got I got stuff to do. Crow, what have you got for us this week? I like to move it, move it. Um, so we're talking about Move It. It's a service from a company called Progress, or formerly known as Ipswich. And according to its very own website. Move it, quote, is the leading secure managed file transfer software used by thousands of organizations around the world to provide complete mm. visibility and control over file transfer activities. It goes on to say it enables your organization to meet compliance standards, easily ensure the reliability of core business processes, and most importantly, secure the transfer of sensitive data between partners, customers, users, and systems. Right. And plus, they have a ton of badges on their homepage. <laughs> like, I don't oh, know. There you go. I'm sold. I don't actually recognize who is the um, giver of these badges because it's only got a logo that I was unable to do a, an image reverse search to find out. But it's like the leader, best usability, best relationship, best ROI, most implementable, top 50. Okay, yeah. So it sounds impressive. You know, if you were going to look at them as a potential, uh, you know, customer, because somehow you didn't want to use HTTPS, <laughs> you know, you would meet compliance requirements. Your businesses won't fall prey to nasty scammers. 
which is great because then you can share all your more sensitive information with others without a worry that it might get into the wrong hands. Sure. So it's like a hallelujah moment for, I'm sure, many companies. And maybe this is why award-winning, quote-unquote, payroll firm Zealous was so impressed by the product and the awards and the wording decided to implement MoveIt as part of its business. Yeah. Now, however, under these awards and promises of great security, there was unfortunately a zero-day vulnerability in the MoveIt code, an undiscovered vulnerability that allowed a notorious hacking group known as CLOP to infiltrate its system and hoover up data. And this is where our hallelujah moment becomes an oh poopy moment, I think, because it's... I think it was clop, not plop. (laughs) (laughs) See, that would have been good. You see, I wasn't on my game today. So it seems that this zero day vulnerability was initially noticed by Mandiant. This is the threat intelligence people now part of Microsoft. And they reported that they saw behaviors that seemed very in line with extortion attacks, like in other words, ransomware there didn't seem to be a demand for cash, or at least right away. But it did come a week later on the 6th of June, says Mandiant. Um, the Russian link threat actors, CLOP or PLOP, if you'd like to call them that, published a statement claiming responsibility for this activity and threatened to post a stolen data if victims uh, didn't pay the extortion fee or the ransom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But what's unusual about this is that they didn't just go after progress, the makers of MoveIt, right? So when you have a ransom, you often will hit the, you know, the people that you've uh, attacked. You'll say, hey, give me money and I'll get your files back or whatever. But they also went after MoveIt customers, customers like Zealous. And Zealous, too, issued a statement. Because they said, we can confirm that a small number of our customers have been impacted by this global issue, and we are actively working to support them. And it says, you know, it makes very clear that all Zealous owned software was ineffective, and there's no associated incidents or compromises to any other part of our IT estate. Because they're in a bit of a panic, right? Mm. Yeah. And hear that, a small number of customers, that's what caught my eye. Well, that's what they always say. That's that's phase one. A small number of customers. Yes. Yeah. So let me. We won't give you a percentage. We're just it's, we're a small small number. It's only got it's a percentage, but it's only probably got two digits in it. A very small number of digits <laughs> in the percentage. Your security is important to us. Exactly. <laughs> So I, I thought I'd name a few uh, customers, and you could tell me if you even heard right. of them. Oh, because, okay. Because, you know, yeah. tiny, yeah. small number of customers. Yeah, yeah. tiny. Yeah. Um, okay, so British Airways. Mm, okay, so rings a bell. Oh, yeah. Never heard of them. Never heard of them, no. BBC? Mm. Oh, mm. vaguely, mm. vaguely. Yeah. Hmm. Boots? Mm-hmm. Oh. Jaguar? Yes. HSC? Iceland? Not the country. <laughs> but the de- <laughs> The depart- Do you remember, Graham? Graham and I once were having a conversation and he was telling me about this, what, this uh, this pop star. I can't remember her name. Ke- what was her name? Kerry Katona. Yeah, she, was, she was hired as the representative of Iceland. Yeah, yeah that's and, right. Yeah. And Graham was talking about this and I was like, why would the country Iceland have her? And we went on for about 10 minutes and I just go, I don't understand. And then we realized <laughs> okay. we were talking about the supermarket, not the country. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm not familiar with that supermarket. Interesting. Yeah. Basically, a lot of frozen stuff. <laughs> Luck, lucky you. <laughs> lucky you. Yeah. It's not great. Hey, hey, it is great. You watch your tongue. You haven't been there in a while. I'm a fan. Um, so other companies include Dyson, Range Rover, Transport of London, and, you know, of course, the Pièce de Résistance Ofcom itself. But it's way bigger than this, because from my research, I believe all the companies I've listed were Zealous users, right? Using the payroll yeah. for, for, for the company. So Zealous yeah. provides this payroll system. But what about all the other MoveIt customers? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. So the U.S. Cybersecurity Infrastructure uh, Security Agency issued an advisory on Wednesday regarding Klopp's campaign to exploit the MoveIt service, warning the gang had historically compromised more than 3,000 U.S.-based organizations and 8,000 global organizations. So these guys are well-known and um, seems fairly successful in terms of stealing cash from people. Yeah. 
So, so just to recap, the MoveIt software has a vulnerability. Companies that directly use the MoveIt service were obviously impacted. I get that. But of course, uh, so were their own customers. So customers like the ones we've just listed. So you have all these pretty, in some cases, massive companies who they themselves don't use MoveIt software from Progress having to deal with the fallout informing customers, issuing statements, taking the heat from journalists and people like us who want all the details. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting supply chain nightmare, isn't yeah. it? Oh, it absolutely is. And it's so bad, of course, for the image of the companies whose data has been affected. So the British Airways, the Boots, the BBCs of this world who've been mm-hmm. impacted by this because of course the headline simply says data leak involving BBC say payroll data. Yeah. But the BBC it's not like they ran any vulnerable software. They simply were using a supplier who themselves were using some third-party software, which had the bug in it. I just feel sorry for everybody. I feel sorry yeah. for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Because ultimately, but, but, it's Klopp who are the big poo-poo heads, to use your terminology, the, They're the Plops. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and it points to this movement uh, we've seen here with our federal government for S-bombs, which are software bills and materials, mm. uh, to have it listed, all of those third-party dependencies. So at least you know going in, this is who we use for this, this is who we use for that, so that you can have your due diligence done ahead of time. These are S-bombs, not F-bombs. Is that right? I haven't, right, okay. Correct, right. correct. No, F-bombs F bombs are what Carell drops when she's had a few too many. Uh, S-bombs are software bills and materials. Carell? <laughs> Carell, sorry. I am so careful about pronouncing your name right, and the one time I screw it up, you call me on it. <laughs> it's only because we're recording it. Ugh. And you know, my sister is named Carol, so... <laughs> This is not easy for oh. me. I will also add that um, Progress Software, the folks who make Move It, they uh, we covered this yesterday on the Influential Cyberwire podcast. That um, <laughs> that they have disclosed a new a second bug. Yes, I was just going to get to that. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I think from what I'm reading, and of course, this is huge. There's loads of writing on this, but they seem to have gotten in a lot of cyber experts to help them. This is progress, right? So to try and help them handle the situation, looking at the websites of of you know progress and and uh, zealous and others they seem to be having advisories right on the home page lots of information about the cvs that are available all that seems pretty good for me and yes there you go another niggle pops up another issue is spotted in the mm-hmm. move it software uh, so companies had to issue another advisory another patch it's a bit of a nightmare, but I'll tell you, the thing that bugs me the most, right? So you've got this company that's affected, and they're like, oh, shit. Like, wherever you are in the chain, you're affected. And what what the clock people are saying yeah. is like, look, pay us, or we're going to actually post this information to, to give it to everybody so that's out there. So your private info is now no longer private. In terms of Zealous, where it's payroll, you're in an employee making, what, 15, 20, 40 grand a year? You know, doing your job, you know, if you're working at the airport, you're maybe working in baggage handling, you're maybe just saying, hi, how do oh, you want to move to first class? You're doing all that. And what you now your data is gone. And what's BA, if it were BA, what is their responsibility towards that? You know, like how, how, how are individuals protected from it? And as far as I'm concerned, they're not. Because we say don't pay, right? That's our advice as well. We say don't pay the ransom. Whose advice? You know, not good. Whose advice? I would say my advice. I think we've talked about this many times in the show. And I think lots of people say don't pay the ransoms because if you pay the ransoms, you're just encouraging the whole model. Yeah, but, you know, I'm I'm sort of a mm, a bit agnostic on that. I'm not sure. I think I think there's many occasions when you should pay the ransom, which may be. When's that? Well, when it when it's (laughs) when it's a case that you're going to bloody well lose your business if you don't pay the ransom or people are going to lose their jobs. I think it's very easy for people just say you should never, ever pay ransoms. It's like, oh, hang on. People could lose their livelihoods or people's yeah. debt. I mean, you know, I, I think maybe right. this is just a bit. And I if agree. you've got cyber insurance as well, which is going to cover you, perhaps, if you're lucky enough that the insurance does cover you, then. 
<laughs> I'd like to see as a cyber insurance company that's well, going to say that in the well, small I've, print I've, today. I've, I've, tell you I've, what. I've never had an insurance company pay me for anything, to be honest. So, I mean, it's, you know, I've never succeeded. So, you know, but, but if you were, if you were <laughs> that one person who managed to get your insurance company to pay up, then uh, maybe that would be great. Yeah. So, so Klopp Ransomware Gang says it's going to start releasing data of companies who haven't contacted it. Yeah. By tomorrow, what, this is day of recording, so the June 14th, and originally apparently it was supposed to be June 12th, but that was a national holiday in Russia, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They need a day off. <laughs> but what, that, did you see their webpage? So they have, sure. they've posted up their, their steps on the webpage of what, oh, yeah. what victims yeah. have to do. It's amazing, isn't it? There's seven steps. So step one, if you have Move It Software, continue to step two, else leave, right? <laughs> Email our team, unlock and gives the address, right? And and our team will email you with dedicated chat URL over Tor. So we don't want to be, we don't want anyone listening to this. That's how we're going to be secure. Um, And if we don't hear from you uh, until June 14th, we'll post your name on this page. So it keeps going on and on. You can look it on the show notes. Let's not forget that the Klopp ransomware gang, this is a, this is a major initiative for them because, because, They've got data from so many companies. This is going to be a big job for them to deal with. And maybe they'll be hiring people on Fiverr and the like. Maybe people who've been made redundant from companies who've uh, previously had ransomware attacks and made them unemployed. Uh, Maybe the ransomware gangs will actually begin to employ people to handle future ransomware. I'm just mad today. I think it's the heat in this room, Carol. So let me ask you this. If you're if you're one of the companies who has fallen victim to this, if you're British Airways or you're Jaguar or yes. who, who, all those indirectly things. fallen victim, yeah. Right. Because yeah. of a third party provider. Is the proper attitude these days in terms of your security posture to assume breach? In terms of your risk equation. Is it proper to assume that your third party vendors are likely to be popped? I think so. And I think when you're writing contracts with these people, you need to double check their security and make sure that the same standards you have in place at your organization are also in place at their organization as well. I think many providers now are being asked to make those sort of um, commitments. Like in terms of Zealous, for example. So it's a payroll company, right? Mm. Loads of people want payroll companies or Mm. payroll software. And, you know, I've heard of Zealous before today. Like, it's a well-known payroll company. And so loads of people will be using that and then suddenly just going, oh, shit. But again, Zealous is a victim as well. Like, it wasn't in their code, right? No. So... It's a bit of a nightmare all around. And like the funny thing is, is the Klopp Kings should have, you know, been a thing of the past because in 2021, the hackers were arrested, the the alleged Klopp hackers were arrested in Ukraine in a joint operation between Ukraine, US and South Korea. And at the time, authorities claimed to have taken down the group, which they said was responsible for extorting $500 million from victims around the world. But, you know, as Joe Tidy wrote in BBC, it has continued to be a persistent threat. There's always another clop floating around, which you just can't flush away. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) there you go. Well, the advice, guys, the advice is not complicated. If you use a move it, apply the up-to-date patches, pronto. There was one, I can't remember who wrote it, but they were like, we encourage our customers to install the, you know, and I'm like, don't encourage. I'm like, don't put that on the 15th paragraph going, we would like to encourage our customers. <laughs> don't do that. Just say, install the fucking thing. <laughs> so yeah, so move it cloud customers and move it transfer customers. Uh, I think cloud had been patched, but you want to review your audit logs and, you know, for signs of unexpected or unusual file downloads. Yeah. I wonder how many people are moving it to other companies. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's kind of a bit of a nightmare. And I think I couldn't find a list of all the companies. I would have liked that, you know, as Zeller saying, you know, here are all the companies that are affected. Of course, they don't want to do that because they're getting everyone else in the shit, I guess. But you mm-hmm. kind of want to know who are, who who is everyone? Like, give me the well, list also, of all the companies. Uh, also, their commercial rival is going to contact all of their customers. And we see you're currently the <laughs> customer. Of- <laughs> I didn't think about that. Yeah. It's a pickle. It's a sticky pickle. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing worse than relying on a legacy SIM that your security team has outgrown, especially when it impacts your ability to detect real incidents. 
Well, Hunters is a securities operations centre, or SOC, platform built to empower your security team to reduce risk, complexity, and costs. With Hunters, you can ingest and normalize as much data as you have at a predictable cost. You can automatically cross-correlate data logs from your entire security and IT stack to connect and track events throughout your organization. And you can leverage out-of-the-box and always up-to-date detections that cover 80% of security use cases. Using Hunters, a CISO at a leading online retailer tripled the amount of data ingested by her security team while cutting costs from a legacy SIM provider by 75%. Visit hunters.security to learn how your organization can move beyond SIM with Hunters. That's hunters.security and thanks them for sponsoring the show. Smashing security listeners, did you know that Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work? Bitwarden's password manager securely stores credentials spanning across personal and business worlds. And every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of a personal vault, which allows you to store all your personal credentials. These are unique and secure passwords for every single account you access. And it's easy to set up. It's easy to use. I honestly love Bitwarden. I use it at home, use it at work, use it on the go. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan at bitwarden.com forward slash smashing. Or you can even try it for free across devices as an individual user. Check it out at bitwarden.com forward slash smashing. And thanks to Bitwarden for sponsoring the show. Now, there's some big news from our sponsor, Collide. If you are an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet up to 100% compliant. How do they do that, you're asking yourself? Well, if a device isn't compliant, the user can't log into your cloud apps until they fix the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in zero trust architecture, which is device compliance. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Unsecured devices are logging into your company's apps because there's nothing there to stop them. Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication and it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions on how to fix it. If they don't fix the problem, within a set time, they are blocked. Collide means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash smashing to learn more or to book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash smashing. And welcome back and you join us at our favourite part of the show, the part of the show that we like to call Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week. Pick of the Week is the part of the show where everyone chooses something they like. Could be a funny story, a book that they've read, a TV show, a movie, a record, a podcast, a website or an app. Whatever they wish. It doesn't have to be security related necessarily. Better Better not not be. be. (laughs) Well, my Pick of the Week this week is not security related. I would like to cast you back in time again, four years ago. In episode 126, 200 episodes of Smashing Oh, I remember it well. Yes, we spoke about zombie chickens with Mark Stockley in that episode. Yes. Now, my pick of the week that week was a movie I'd been to see, which I thought was absolutely bloody brilliant, called Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And what I can tell you is now, four years later, there's a sequel. And it's (laughs) equally brilliant. Yeah. It is incredible. I'm not into superhero movies. I find them really, really boring. Do you watch them and go, I could do that? I could do no, that. No, I just, I just fall asleep. I just fall asleep. If I ever see another washing machine fighting another washing machine in some Transformers flick, I just, like, for goodness sake. But Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is a Spider-Man movie which is completely animated and it is beautiful. All the yeah. way through it, you think, well, if I were to pause this movie... Every single frame, you just think that is an absolute work of art. 
Really? Was like a whole true. variety of. Have you never seen one of these? No. <gasps> okay. Uh, I saw it over the weekend, and and Graham is spot on. Every frame in this film is a painting. Yeah. Wow. It's it's abs- If you're into art, crawl. I heard a little dick, a little dicky bear told me that you might be. Um, I would recommend it, but. Ideally, go and see the first one. So the first one's called Into the Spider-Verse. The one that should just come out is called Across the Spider-Verse. Is that They're- streamable? Because I'm on, uh, I'm on holiday in a remote location at the moment. The first one is. Into the Spider-Verse will definitely be uh, streamable. You may not okay. have to pay for it either if you subscribe to a streaming service. And it's fantastic. And I'm not a Spider-Man fan, but I would imagine that if I were a Spider-Man fan... There must be so many in jokes and so many little references which are just zooming past me. Um, I, I but, but it doesn't matter. I still yes. absolutely love yes. it. And Kroll, if you need any <laughs> further endorsement, you can check out what Mark Commode said about this movie as well. Oh, where I do he like completely Mark raved Mark. about it. I know you're a fan of his. But so yes, I am. Tell me, Dave, what did you think? Did you like the film as well? Like as a as a plot and as a movie. Mm-hmm. Yes. No, I, I am. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, it may be better than the original. And I think the original was one of what? the best movies I've ever seen. God, I've been living under a rock. You, you just don't see it coming. This this animated Spider-Man movie. But it is uh, it's just an artistic achievement. It, it is brilliant. And uh, the it is bold. Uh, both in the storytelling, yeah. uh, but just the style of the art is unlike anything you've seen before. And they swung for the fences and they hit the ball out of the park. It is just uh, amazing what they've been able to do here. I wasn't expecting the sequel to be as good as the original, but it really is. And as Dave yeah. says, possibly even better, actually. And there is going to be a third part coming out next March. And I can't mind if it's Mark Komodo or someone else, but I, I certainly sort of believe in this. There are people who are saying this could be the greatest trilogy of movies there's ever mm. been. What? So, this is insane, guys. Okay, okay. I'll check it out. I will check it out. I'll check it so out. So my pick of the week is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. But if you don't want to go to the cinema, check out your streaming services and maybe you can see the original Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, first of all, because they both are amazing movies. Yes, and I will add that if you can see this in the cinema on a big screen, do so. That, mm-hmm. That's what yes. I did over over the weekend, and it is a film that deserves to be seen on as big a screen as you Absolutely. can see it on. Yeah, uh, yeah, it just washes over you, and it, it really is something to see. So oh, I'll, take, I'll take the big hairy man out for a date in the movie theater when I'm back in uh, <laughs> in civilization. There you go. Give him a nice bucket full of popcorn. People might think he's a spider, Carol. That's the only danger. <laughs> Maybe a hedgehog. <laughs> Dave, what's your pick of the week? So my pick of the week is uh, related to one of my favorite things in the world, which are the Muppets. <laughs> A uh, longtime Muppet fan from my early days watching Sesame Street and then, of course, The Muppet Show and The Muppet Movies. <laughs> well, The Muppets are back and uh, The Muppets are owned by Disney these days. And Disney has put out a 10 episode series called The Muppets Mayhem. And this is the story of Dr. Teeth and the Electric Mayhem, which is one of the all time great band names <laughs> ever. Um, and the story is that. Uh, Long ago, when the Electric Mayhem were formed, they were given a recording contract, but they never got around to making an album. (laughs) And now it's been like 35, 40 years and someone calls them on it and says, we gave you several hundred thousand dollars a few decades ago and we want our album. And so this is all about the Electric Mayhem coming together to try to make their album and it is really funny. Uh, it captures the spirit of the Muppets that I would say has been missing for a long ah. time. The original spirit of the Muppets where it was funny, but also heartfelt. And you felt as though these characters were grounded in reality and that they they genuinely care for each other. And um, this has all of that. It's It's well written. It feels like authentic muppet content there are a ton of hilarious cameos as muppets tend to have uh again it's 10 episodes it's on disney plus the muppets mayhem highly recommended and that is my pick of the week 
God, it's going on my list as well because I loved the Muppets as a kid. Like I was, there was <laughs> yeah. that, that was the show that I would not miss. It was, I think, it was Saturday at seven or something. It played mm-hmm. and it was when when the Muppet Show was on. It was the most popular really, show in the eh? world. I loved it. You yeah. know who are my favorites, but they don't show up in the Muppets movies or. Is is Bert and Ernie? They're your favorites. They're, they're only seem to be. No, those are Sesame Street Muppets. I love Bert and Ernie. Yeah, sure, they're hilarious. They're great. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're like Laurel and Hardy. They are A little gay couple living together. That's what I like. Yep. Why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're wonderful. No strings. Carol, what's your pick of the week? Well, my pick of the week is the mic that I am talking on now. I <laughs> am away from my studio. Mm-hmm. I am in a very uh, uh, handmade area to try and do this recording with the best sound. So if you think the sound is like, hey, that's not bad, crawl. Um, I'm using the Rode NT-USB Mini. And Graham, I think you've got one of these as well, don't you? I didn't know that you did, but I after I bought it, I told you. And I'm like, oh yeah, I got one of myself. Yeah, I have one for when I'm traveling, if I need to do a yeah. podcast or something. Yeah. So rather than Me my too. normal... Oh, well, they are. You do too? Even yep. Dave. There's See the trifecta. The so, ultimate endorsement. <laughs> Dave's got one. Ex- there you go. So like, so so people, like for us, it, it, I think it cost me like 80 or 90 pounds. So about 100 bucks. Yep. Dave, would that be yeah. about right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is so clever and simple and great. And my favorite bit of it is the whole um, magnetic base component of it. So it can just slot into its base with this little tiny magnet that holds mm-hmm. it together. But when you want to put it in your bag, you can take it right off. No no unscrewing, none of that crap. Plus, you can put it on a road arm or any other arm, right? It's, it's simple. I mean, there's not much to talk about other than it's really small. It's solid. It's cleverly designed. And I think it's just a beautiful piece of machinery. And if the sounds good, listeners. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and for travel, it's it's lightweight. Yeah, it's got good sound. It's it's it travels yeah. well, uh, and it's cheap enough that if for some reason you were to lose it, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Yeah, and like I've I've been recording here as we've done this recording, I've heard myself pop a bit, which is something because I don't have my pop filter with me. It does say it has a built-in one, but I have heard myself pop a little. So you do have to be a little bit careful or be an editing queen like me. <laughs> yeah. But honestly, I think it's I think it's a really good piece of kit for the price. I, I recommend it. Um, and I love that it fits in a bag. Simply, easy, tiny, yeah. doesn't take up any space. And it's solid, isn't it? You don't think it's going to fall apart. It's solid. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, so my pick of the week this week is yeah. the Rode NT-USB Mini. It's got my vote. Fantastic. Well, that just about wraps up the show for this week. Dave, I'm sure lots of our listeners would love to follow you online and find out what you're up to. What's the best way for folks to they do that? They can go to our website. It is n2k.com. That's the letter N, the number two, the letter K.com. Mm. Oh, nice short domain mm-hmm. name there. And you can follow us on Twitter at Smash In Security. No G. Twitter will not allow us to have a G. And you can also look for us up on Mastodon and also, don't forget to ensure that you never miss another episode. Follow Smashing Security in your favourite podcast apps, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Overcast. And huge, huge, huge thank you to this episode's sponsors, Collide, Cyber Hunters and Bitwarden. And of course, to our wonderful Patreon community. It's thanks to them all. This show is free. For episode show notes, sponsorship info, guest list and the entire back catalogue of more than 325 episodes, check out SmashingSecurity.com. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. There you go. It's a wrap. Very nice. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. Safe travels, Carol. Corral, 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 corral. Thanks, Dove. You can call me Crawly. Can I, can I call you Crawly? <laughs> yeah, of course you can. But that's my nickname. I used to be a swimmer, you know, front crawl, Crawly. Crawly. Oh, I, I always imagined it was because of creepy, I thought. Creepy I Crawly. I didn't, I didn't think of front crawl. You know, my name I in Australian is D-I-V-E. Dive. 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 Dive.
Right. Dive. That's dive. <laughs> That's my name in Australian. Dive. <laughs> Good day, dive. I'm calling you that from now on. <laughs>